As the nation continues to grapple with the coronavirus pandemic, two fall activities are raising safety concerns. Now think about this, folks, the reopening of schools and in-person voting. Joining me now to discuss is pandemic expert D Dina, Dr. Dina Grayson. Sorry about that, doctor. Um, so, okay, which one is it? Is it, is it safe to go to school? And is it safe to go vote? Which one are safe, which one isn't, and why are they different? Well, one size doesn't fit all, Eric. I mean, as we know that this pandemic has been spreading throughout the country, first starting on our coasts, especially in New York State and New York City. And now what we're seeing is really the nation's heartland that's become um, really the epicenter, along with, of course, my home state here in Florida, uh, Texas and California. So it really depends on where you live. And the bottom line is, Eric, is if you live in a community where there is active, ongoing community spread of this deadly virus, it is a very bad idea to reopen schools. I mean, you can just ask Israel. Uh, Israel has one of the largest outbreaks in the entire world just from reopening one school in Jerusalem. So, and so that virus spread like wildfire. Doc, here's, what, here's the point I'm trying to make. There, there are people, there are, I don't want to make this, this political, but I, I, to a certain extent, I think it is. There, there are areas, states, let's take states, for example, where they're saying schools should open because it's time to open schools. But mail-in voting needs to be the thing because it's too dangerous to go vote. Can they... Can these two ideas live in the same state? Well, again, it depends on specifically where you are in that state. But in general, Eric, schools we know, you're packing kids in uh, closely together. Um, a lot of public schools, they can't do that social distancing because they don't have the physical space. And you're having kids in a classroom all day next to one another. Depending on where you vote, it may well be you go in and you're wearing your mask and I know you're a good mask wearer and you're able to vote and leave very quickly. That would be a relatively low risk thing to do, sort of like going to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. But if you have to stand in line for six hours next to that same person who happens to be infected, that could be a much higher risk Bad activity. Idea. If you're Bad idea. But there's good news because finally the world has a vaccine for the virus. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so uh, Vladimir Putin says, and if you believe what Vladimir Putin says, then, you know, I've got a bridge in Brooklyn to sell you. So what Russia has done essentially is said, OK, we're going to go ahead and approve our vaccine, maybe at sort of the same stage we're at here in this country. And I say maybe sort of. I mean, Russia is not known uh, for their world expertise in developing new treatments and vaccines. But what they have done is accelerate um, and just based upon very minimal data, and I, I should put data sort of in quotes here because no one has actually seen the data outside of the very few researchers on Putin's payroll. So I, I think a lot of us look at this with a lot of skepticism and certainly um, have a lot of concerns about potential safety now that this vaccine is going to supposedly be right. used out in the wild with really no other testing or monitoring of these um, unsuspecting patients. A couple of uh, very obvious observations. Number one, you see that little graphic we had flying around there. That was pretty cool. I guess uh, this is Sputnik vaccine. Number two, don't don't take anything that comes out of Russia until it's been very no. much tested. I to stay away from that for a while. And number three, don't even drink Russian vodka because it's not even that good. Doctor, <laughs> no. um, over the last week or so, there's a big motorcycle gathering in, in uh, Sturgis, South Dakota. Do you think this will be one of those super spreader events? Uh, well, Eric, I think that a lot of us, uh, you know, in the medical community have a ton of concern about this. Um, I think one of the saving graces is that a lot of times motorcyclists, of course, out and about, they're on their own motorcycle. Again, relatively low, low risk. It's then once they go to those bars, and we know that bars, just like schools, and unfortunately, um, you know, churches and other areas of religious worship, these tend to be places where outbreaks spring up. And that's really the concern. We're going to have people from all over the country gathering in one place, I'm assuming that many of these people, unfortunately, will not be mask wearers. And then if they're now indoors in bars where they're shouting and in each other's faces, um, this is really setting up for a nightmare situation. Literally 30 seconds, Doc. I got to just got to cut you to 30. Um, the SEC has decided they haven't decided whether they're going to play football or not. The Big Ten and the Pac-12 said now our, 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 our kids, our students at risk by, by playing college football. 
Well, I mean, imagine being a lineman. I'm a, I'm a Florida Gator, so go Gators. And as much as we all love our college sports, I think that it is extremely unwise right now to be putting players along with coaching staff and, uh, you know, in at risk for this virus. It's just not the right time. As always, the sensible person in the room, because I want to see football. I just I just need to see some <laughs> SEC. I got to see Alabama. I got to see my my my, my uh, Clemson Tigers defend their championship. Dr. Dean Grayson, thank you so much as always. Thanks for having me, Eric.